Well, I, Seth, I lived in Boulder. Uh, let's see, I came in uh, August of 52, and then immediately spent 10 years up in Wall Street, Colorado, up Far Mile Canyon. That, yeah, Wall Street, that's just, uh, just before, uh, before it turns to dirt road. Was it dirt road? Well, it was a dirt road, yeah, right. It is Wall Street, but, but uh, if you follow that road up four miles, it heads towards... Wall Street is the name of the town, not the street. Oh, yeah, well, we think of it as a street. I know it, and that's a mistake. Wall Street is the town itself, an old gold and silver a mine, a mining town uh, from yesteryear. Okay. So uh, why did you come? Or why did you stay? Why I came to Boulder? Yeah. Well, the story, the, com the coming to Boulder was involved with World War II. Uh, I had a buddy that went to war, and then, um, and, and uh, to make this long story short, he was shot in Germany, and then after he uh, began to get a little better, they, he was shot by the Germans, then they sent him to R&R, &R, which is rest and, re rest, rest and Recreation, in Switzerland, and there he learned to ski. And then, of course, he wrote to me and told me about his skiing. And then when he was healthy enough and the war was over, he came back to this country and he went to see you on the GI Bill. And he went to see you because of, because of the proximity of, of skiing, because he loved skiing. And then in the interim, he, um, he invited me out several times. Starting approximately 1948. And so where did you come from? Where did I come from? I came from a suburb of Chicago named Berwyn. So you showed up here to, to visit your friend, and then you ended up staying. And so how did you survive in Boulder? What was Boulder like in 1952? Well, one of the most remarkable memories is that it was it was something like a little Hollywood Western town. And uh, you won't believe this, but when I came in '52, there was a steam passenger locomotive that came into Boulder every day. Steam, passenger locomotive. And in the morning, you could hear the engineer blowing the whistle for all the main cross crossings coming from the main line out east. And to hear that steam whistle early in the morning was most romantic. And is that where the, uh, the historic uh, trains are over there at the bench? Well, it came down the middle of Canyon, what is now Cam Cam Canyon Boulevard. The name of it then, at that time, was Water Street. And there was one track that came down, right down the middle of it. The fact that Water Street is so wide is not because the city fathers planned it that way, but because that was the given Colorado right of way, given by Colorado to railroads. That's why Canyon Boulevard now is so wide. I don't know how many feet that is. That must be maybe, uh, I, I, I'm guessing 150 feet, a railroad wide right away, given by the Colorado State. So how did you uh, make your living? What did you do in Boulder when, you know, it was such a small, tiny town? Well, it was a real small town. We had, we had a, grain a grain elevator right downtown, and there were many, many uh, gravel roads yet. But I came and I got my start here uh, as a typewriter and adding machine mechanic, I worked for a real old-fashioned office supply store uh, on Broadway near Spruce. It was called the Boulder Typewriter Exchange, and I ran the shop. Hmm? What would that be now? What building would that be now? Well, it's it was it's one door, it's one door south of Spruce Street on Broadway on the west side of the street. That's where the, there, that, that's where the, the store was. That's a pretty big, and yeah, what stands there now? What is there now? Oh, since that time it had all types of different novelty shops, gift shops, and uh, I can't remember anymore in, 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 the, in the following years. There were all kinds of people in there. But right from the beginning, it remained a typewriter and adding machine shop and office supply store. 
And so what did you do? Well, how old were you in 52? I was, uh, well, let's see, I was 49. I'm 49 now. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> in 52, I was uh, uh, 32. I was impressed with their... And so what did you do? Uh, what did you do for entertainment? What, what, what was the town like? I'd like to talk to somebody. Well, after I, after I came out of Wall Street after 10 years, after selling out my cabin, then the, 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 the town was very much like it is now on a much smaller scale. We had the entertainment, we had theaters, and we had plays to go to. But it was all on a smaller scale, and the town moved very slowly. The people were slower. There wasn't the high tension that there is now. I mean, I went to Ohio State. Why do you think it's, it's changed other than growing? Has the, the attitude changed as well? Or? Well, I think the attitude of the people has grown more tense because of more of the high-tech living and high-speed living. It wasn't like that long time ago. They were more laid back, more friendly. They had more time to talk to you. The traffic situation wasn't uh, wasn't tense hardly at all. Were there families hanging out on the streets, or were there family? Families hanging out on the streets. Uh, you know, you don't see many families really, other than passing by. And you know, there doesn't seem to be much of a community now. Was there a community feeling back in the 50s and 60s? As far as I know, um, there was. I didn't. I didn't participate participate too much in the community community affairs, but uh, as far as I know, there was. And of course, uh, the gravel streets. When the wind blew, this was like a western town with a high wind blowing through it dust all over the place. Would, would you have ever imagined that it would become such a uh, cosmopolitan? Never. I never, I could never believe it after almost 50 years now. I can't believe it that Boulder has grown so greatly. And what about the wealth in this town? I mean, well, the wealth, I think there's a lot of money in this town. Was there some money in the town previously, you know, 30 years ago? 40 years ago, 45? Were there people in town? Well, the, uh, the extent of the wealth and the... Uh, oh, I have no... I, I don't have any uh, figures on the wealth. But I think that there were a good portion of richer people living here, all relative to the age that they were living in, in here. And I worked for the University of Colorado. I started there... Uh, I started there in 1955, and I worked in the, uh, the uh, Office of Contracts and Grants, and that is a research administration office, and I worked there 30 years in that office. And, and how was the university then? Well, the university in 55, when I started, we had approximately 7,500 uh, students. Very small. Very, very wonderful. And what were their interests? There were their interests. I would say that their interests were primarily, primarily education, and then they had all the student activities on a small scale. Human beings haven't changed. Students haven't changed. But it feels like that. Well, it feels like that. I suppose so. But it seems like in that time, everything was a little bit, a little slower. You saw, you saw engineers walking around with sli slide rules dangling from their belts instead of computers. Do you, do, you find, do you find people more intelligent today? Do I find them more intelligent? Well, I think the intelligence has risen, I, I think it has risen with uh, the more high-tech world we live in now, in Boulder here and all over. But is that a, a, a good, in a good way, or? In a, in a good way? Yeah. Well, I would say it's, it's good in the fact that we are bound to grow. And with the growth, we have to use our intelligence to handle the, the situation the best way we can. How about the uh, values in uh, ethics? 
of human beings in Boulder? In the ethics of human beings? Well, I think the ethics, in my, in, in my opinion, ethics have probably dropped down a bit because of the jamming of the people together, the crowding. They don't have as much time to talk to you as they, as they, and I think it's a product, a product of the high tense world, high tension world we live in now. And that's only because of the speed and the, uh, the, 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 the that's what? the boxing in of people and the, the speed. And the, the boxing in? The, the uh, close proximity of people. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, I would say so. It's actually driven people further away from each other. You know, my father used to tell me years ago, he used to, he used to say, Ray, he says, you know, you put too many rats in a box and they start killing themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Have you found that uh, it's even accelerated? It's, it's accelerating even more and more quickly, exponentially? Yeah, it seems to be accelerating more and more. We're getting bigger and bigger, and with the, and with the growth in size, everything is picking up speed. <laughs> when are we going to slow down? Again? I have no idea. Don't ask me. I have no. I don't think there's ever going to be a slowdown. I think it's just gradually going to sprawl all over the place. And what happens then? They, we have provided for open space all around the town, but now the community and the areas east and south and north of the of the. Uh, an open space, they're all building up in the little communities themselves, inclusive of shopping centers. That's the way it is. <laughs> like Walter Cronkite used to say, that's the way it is. So how were you able to uh, afford to live in Boulder, uh, seeing as that the, uh, the housing market and the, and the cost of living is, has risen? Well, when I, went for the type, when I went to the typewriter shop, I'll just give you my, my uh, that's all I know, it's my experience. When I went to the typewriter shop, I had I, I got I started out with forty dollars a week for a six day week, and then gradually I told the boss that I've got to have more time because at that time stores were closed on Sunday, and I couldn't get my stuff done. So he said, "Well, he says," um, uh, and I said, "I'd like I'd like a Saturday off all all of Saturday off." Well, he says, I don't know about that. Um, I'll give you half a day Saturday off, and I'll raise you 50 to $50 from $40 a week. And I made it. I made it somehow. And even that was when I lived in Wall Street yet. I had to drive up there and drive back. But I lived very cheaply. I'm single. I didn't have a family to provide for. So how did you uh, how did you evolve from that? How did, how did you uh, move into uh, modern society? You know, oh, I kind of just went with the flow. <laughs> I moved into modern society. I have I have I'm not really moved into modern society. I still have a rotary phone and I don't have a computer and I still type on a manual typewriter. So I'm way behind society. But that's all right, I get by. Yeah, you seem to be living quite well. You seem to be doing quite well. And oh, sure, I'm retired. You know, after 30 years, I, thir I, I, I handled university business for 30 years, and now all I got to handle is monkey business. <laughs> and how is monkey business? <laughs> monkey business is fine. I go out to all the restaurants, meet all kinds of interesting people, which you meet in Boulder. And, and you don't often find a, a, a man uh, up in his years that is hanging out in uh, cafes and bars and uh, entertainment areas? And well, no, I suppose the proportion of them is not, is, is not great because this, this is a young town. It's a very young town. Yes, and it stays, and the university, you see, in that proper sense, never grows old because there's always new kids coming in and, the old, and, and then they graduate, so the, the, univer the university stays young. 
The great problem of working with a university, I found, was that after working there many, many years, you find out that the university is staying young, but you, the employee, is getting older and older and older. How long is it? You see what I mean? And yet you've been able to somewhat stay in the flow and the go. I stay in the flow and I'm on the go. And how do you do it? Why don't, why don't we see more uh, elderly men and women out, out and about? Well, I don't know, really. I don't know. I just, um, I'm free to go when I, where I want to, and I get my, I get my pension from the university. And so uh, I just spend it down here on West Pearl. <laughs> and all, and many of the selected bars. <laughs> and so, uh, you don't, you don't find that the, the young, younger people uh, get on your nerves. You're not uh, no, no. by their attitude. No. Oh, sometimes I do, but uh, not generally, because I remember when I was young. You see, I can't blame them. They didn't, they didn't, they, they hardly did anything that the things that we did when we were kids back in the suburb of Chicago. We used to collect rotten eggs from the fruit stores. And we'd take them in my wagon and let set them out in the sun for three or four days. And then at night from a dark alley or a passageway, we'd throw these rotten eggs at streetcars in the summertime. And in the summertime, the streetcars, each, each passenger seat had open windows. And we'd throw, egg, throw rotten eggs in there. Listen, those eggs were worse than mustard gas. You ever, see, you ever open up a rotten egg? It's black black and that the, the, the smell is stifling you'll throw your head back <laughs> and so you haven't come to resent the uh, the influx of of, uh, of people from from out the country who are are wealthy and they drop down money and they they open up turn new businesses but you, you don't resent that people who just well i kind of take it in in stride there's bound to be strife with new businesses opening and, and with an increasing competition. But um, I've been in business and I can understand that. And so I take it pretty much in stride. Along with all the controversy and confrontations of having too many business in a small area, the competition is very severe. But that is nothing new. The competition has always been severe in the business world. I, I perceive, though, that the competition is almost squeezing out uh, the, uh, the lesser well-to-do uh, customers. Uh, you know, if the businesses that are growing around town are almost outclassing the uh, lower stratosphere of the economic uh, people in this town. Do you find that? You know, uh, that there's a lot of people that uh, can't even afford to uh, to go to the restaurants here because they, they've become so exclusive. And it's very, very, very true. Very true. And uh, I don't understand it all. I don't under, uh, understand economics. I wasn't in that field. And I have not spent uh, studied business trends and monetary values along with the increasing population and densities. I don't know much about that. I'm more of a romantic, bolder romantic. So what romanticized for us? Romanticized for us? Well, it was small. And I think that uh, if they wanted to make a, we a Western, if Hollywood came here and wanted to make a Western, right downtown in Boulder, all I had to do was cover up the pavement with sand and block out a few telephone poles and electric wires and equip the cowboys and, uh, and their enemies with a, with a couple of good six shooters. We would have had a riotous time right downtown. It was very, very Western. I loved it. But do you, do you still love this town? Oh, I still like it. <laughs> by, by taking it in stride, I kind of it indoctrinated my mind to take it in stride. Instead of sitting back, oh, those were the old days. This, this town nowadays, I don't like it. I, 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 look at a, I look at the big picture of it, or try to. So you're an optimist. Well, I wouldn't say totally, but I'd like to think that way, put it that way. 
<laughs> well, uh, tell me, uh, tell me more. Tell me more? Yeah. Well, when I came to town here, the, the university hired university kids to switch. Uh, well, I shouldn't call them kids. They're kids to me now, of course. But anyway, um, an interesting thing was that the university hired street sweepers. They swept the streets. They swept Broadway, university people, with, with long brooms. They swept it by hand to give the kids something to do and to earn a little money. Roosevelt uh, works? No, no, this was uh, this was way after Roosevelt, see. Roosevelt died in what, 46 or somewhere in there? Then I came in 52, so I can only know so what happened. University. Huh? It was the university. Yeah, yeah, that, that's how they swept the streets. But I remember the pigeon problem here. We had a tremendous, the, this town was, the sky was filled with pigeons. And all the cornices and all the overhangs, uh, the pigeons sat up there day and night and the overhead wires, and they were just dripping <laughs> constantly. You know what? Just dripping. So the city had to do something about it. So what, what the city fathers come up with is that we're going to we're going to kill the pigeons. We're going to shoot them in the morning. We're going to hire a crew to come down at 5.30 in the morning and shoot the pigeons. One by one. Huh? One by one, with rifles. And we'll hire the university kids uh, to, sh to shoot them. And then, when they fell off their perches above the stores and on the wires, and they fell down on the street, the idea was to hire another crew to come along and sweep all the, the pigeons up and wash the blood off the street before the, the women and the men came down to work in the offices. It was ridiculous, ridiculous. <laughs> but that's how it was. And did it work? Well, it didn't, it didn't, it worked to a certain extent. Some pigeons fell on the other side of the facades, on the stores, and then they'd be, they'd be up there in the hot sun and they're dead and they'd be begin to stink up there, you see? <laughs> because nobody knew that they were there until, until, they, until they could smell them all. But anyway, we had, uh, that's how it was. And now comparing it to now, how do you find the fathers of the city, the city council, or the way things are being handled? Well, I'll tell you what, I don't follow them uh, as much as somebody that would have a, a grand interest in it. Uh, no, I, in earlier years I'd follow and watch what the city was doing, but now, uh, oh, I don't know, I got no time to watch them. I got more money than time now, <laughs> so I'm not going to spend it watching too much how they're handling it. It's all relative. Don't forget, I'm 49. Oh yeah. Time, time is, time is creeping on. So, uh, well, I guess, um, how was the 60s, and the 70s, and the 80s? They were years of development. Research at the university. See, I worked for the research unit, uh, the office, the contracts and grants, and after Sputnik. We really began stepping up research in all areas, in the, uh, uh, getting ready for the space age, outer space age, and, and uh, uh, units that, that circled around the Earth because we had to do it. We had to keep up with the Russians and whoever, who el whoever else was doing it. So we were very busy in our office. We had all kinds of research. I remember some of the Air Force, the early Air Force research. It sounds very funny now, but the Air Force gave us a contract to, uh, to experiment with how much the wings of a high-speed airplane heated up at high speed. 
they had it they called this project the aero heating project now it sounds so primitive now but they wanted to know how much those wings heated up at maybe 500 miles an hour See, my job, my job at the university in the office, I, we, uh, most of us, most of us uh, officers held certain uh, uh, specific jobs. Mine was handling all the uh, research equipment used on the, uh, used on the contracts and grants and to make sure it was used as specified and bought under the terms of the contract. So I was a kind of a liaison handling all the property, all the Air Force property, all the Navy property, all the Army property, and NASA property in the Department of Energy, and we had a big contractor at Sanford University. That was my job, to keep track of all the, and communicate, communicate with all those agencies insofar as the affairs of the property was concerned. That's what I did. And, and how did you how how did you feel and how how do you feel now about uh, some of those issues and the politics that were involved with with the Air Force and the military? I don't know much about politics. I don't hardly know anything about politics. All I that's I, why you stayed so optimistic. Well, <laughs> you, hey Seth, you're probably right there. No, I, I have never studied politics. I've kind of shied away from that because I probably didn't have much interest in it. But I did have to be pretty, pretty tough at times in handling what I termed the military mentality because I had to work with all these military people and sometimes they began talking to me and ordering me around, which they had no business doing because I worked for the university and I was in a place to tell them off if I wanted to without getting thrown out of the service. And sometimes, not very many times, but some, some of those military people got on, the, on their high horse. But you've been able to handle those people on a high horse. I handle, oh yeah, I handle all of them. I handle a whole bunch. Now that, that percentage was very small. I don't know, more than, there were less than 5% that people were riding high horses, you know, trying to tell me what to do. But we had all the books and regulations that they did, and they, I wouldn't let them get away with anything. <laughs> well, can you think of uh, some of your favorite moments in history in Boulder? History? In Boulder. The history of Boulder? Well, your favorite moments. Well, I certainly enjoyed when they acquired the, the locomotive down in Central Park, the narrow gauge engine. And incidentally, when I lived in Wall Street, I knew an old man, Albert Hubbard, that was a fireman on that tr train, on that very engine, when he was a kid. But he got permission from his parents to work on the on the railroad uh, at 15 years old. And when he passed on, he was 75 or 76, but I knew him as an older man. His name was Albert Hubbard. And the train, they lived in Wall Street, and of course the train went right through Wall Street. He went up Four Mile Canyon, went up, went up Four Mile Canyon all the way to Sunset, and then it split off. One went to Ward, and one went to um, uh, Glacier Lake. And then they continued on, on from there on, all the way through Cardinal. They wound up in, um, in uh, well, I'm so old now, I'm forgetting the names of that town where they wound, yeah, what is it now? Oh, I can't remember it, but you know it better than I do. Well, I can't remember the name of it. My memory is, I don't know. <laughs> so the, the comings and goings of Boulder, how about in the 60s and 70s, 80s, 90s? Well, those were the highly developing years. And, they, what they, are some of your moments? My moments? I just, I, I just rode along with them. I was, <laughs> I just, uh, I, di I didn't get overly concerned with them because I had come from a big city and the suburbs, and I was familiar with that type of growth. But is there a, is there a few moments that are etched in your memory? You know, as a, an event that occurred, or, 
or the events that occurred? You know, there's one thing that's one or two or three things that stand out. Well, the the the, the acquisition of the open space I thought was a very good idea to save some of that open space and keep it wild. I thought that was a good idea. But how about a, a more personal, like uh, something, uh, an explosion or... Uh, oh, something on that order? Or, or a parade or... Well, there were, I tell you, I, I, I'm not thinking of any specific thing, uh, Seth. Uh, a madcap affair. A, mad, a madcap affair? Well... Everything was madcap at the university at all times, and it still is. So, but we took that in stride too, you know. I, did, I didn't concern myself too much with it somehow or another. I just took it all in stride. Well, I guess that's it. Another, anything else? Oh, I'll tell you another thing. When I, when I came to Boulder at the, uh, at the junction of 28th Street and Arapahoe, what is now 28th and Rapaho, there were ramshackle two by four with board siding, fruit stands on almost every corner. Can you, can you imagine they were selling fruit on 28th and Arapaho? <laughs> and where was the, the hotbed of activity other than the university? The main crossroad, so to speak, was Broadway and Pearl. That was the crossroads of Boulder, right downtown here. That's where it was. That was the big crossing. That's where all the activity, uh, inclusive of uh, inclusive of all the jamming of the cars. Oh, it was a picnic, I'll tell you. Of course, that was before the mall was put in. That's when Pearl Street went through. Very interesting.